everybody. I'm Uzma. My name is Uzma Mashtaq. I'm a professor at the Department of Computer Science uh, at RPI, uh, which is also Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And today I'm presenting online recommendations under cardinality context effect. Um, this is my published research. Uh, so this is talking about my research work. So it is at the intersection of recommender systems, consumer choice models, assortment planning, data science, and statistical learning. My uh, recent work experiences as a senior data scientist and my research application is in online retail and subscription entertainment platforms like Amazon and Netflix. Okay, so today I'm uh, presenting my uh, published research. The first one is a, um, a journal paper, so this one here, and then the second one is a conference paper that's going to appear this year. So I'm, I've kind of tried to combine them and, and present that. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let's talk about the research itself. My, the motivation of my research was more anecdotal in the sense that uh, this comes from a personal experience. Uh, I was visiting a friend and we decided to watch a movie, right? And they had all these options, Netflix, Amazon, uh, and then one or two more other services. And we kept on searching and searching and um, believe it or not, we eventually ended up watching nothing, right? And so that, that experience stayed with me for quite some time, uh, kind of baffled me. And I went back and checked if there is like question number one, does that happen to other people, right? And question number two, uh, well, the, is there a scientific explanation to that behavior? So for my question number one, I found out that there are multiple um, empirical studies and one actually done by Netflix that tells us uh, that if a customer is browsing through the recommendations and they take more than like 60 seconds, which is like a minute, uh, they end up watching nothing. And that is kind of hurting their business. Many people just leave their subscription, which is bad. And the reason for that is a phenomenon known as information overload. So the result of information overload is that customers are overwhelmed by too many options and the decision to, to select becomes complex and that leads to choice deferral, which is really bad, right? All these services really want people to select more and more items like maybe Amazon or Netflix, but, but that doesn't happen if you're providing them with too much information. Okay, so that my, my first question was answered, but what about the second question, right? Uh, which, um, like, is there a scientific explanation? And the answer to that is yes. In consumer behavior theory and cognitive theory in, in specific, this behavior is confirmed. So this is like information overload exists. And in addition to that, there is something really interesting, which is consideration set theory. So I'm going to explain that in the, the picture, like, on the right. And somehow if I can get rid of this. Move that. Yeah. Here, so there is a benefits versus cost trade-off that happens when uh, these are the number of items recommended. So like number of items that you see on your computer screen while you're buying or you're or, or trying to choose a, a movie, right? This is the benefits curve. So obviously there is some benefit attached to the fact that I'm going to buy something or I'm going to choose something, right? But there is a, an information processing cost like this one that goes with it. So that's that's bad because like my brain is working and, and I'm trying to uh, make a selection out of like whatever possible choices I have. And the net result of both of them is this inverted U-shaped curve. So this, this is like an established result in consideration set theory. And as you can see, there is this threshold that exists. So we'll be calling this a threshold throughout, that's Z. And the value that a customer derives from an assortment begins to decline beyond this point. So this was interesting, right? I got like answers to both the questions. And then obviously my next uh, logical step was to find out what are the existing models doing about it. Okay, so there are two different modeling techniques that are in use currently. For, so the first one is uh, recommender systems. I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. What it does is it takes item attributes. For example, you're trying to watch a movie. So there is going to be um, some like genre of movie, right? It's an action movie, right? And then they're gonna check the customer attributes, like whether this customer likes uh, like action movie or not, they're going to do some kind of matching with these recommend, like in these recommender system models, and then recommend top n items. So this n is ambiguous. I don't know how many items, but like some n items, right? And then in, this, in addition to that, there are random utility models or RUMs. These predict, like, what is my user going to select, right? So they, they predict uh, the the probability of somebody selecting something given an assortment. Okay, so all that is good. Basically, both these models take item attributes and customer attributes, put them together, and like either predict whether the customer is going to, to select something or not, or uh, offer them like, okay, this is the top end recommendation, and go ahead. Okay, all that is, is excellent. But then how, um, 
does this fit in? Like I found out from my cognitive science stuff and my empirical studies uh, research that large assortments are, were leading to choice deferral. And I did not find assortment cardinality or assortment size or assortment depth. All those are different names for cardinality, right? That is impacting consumer choice. It is a known context effect, which wasn't taken care of in, in, in these models. Okay, so then let's see how these random utility models are, are predicting like based on the choice probability. Okay, so, so we go here, we have like this, this pool of items, the universe of items, universe of all movies, right? And then there is this, assortment that comes out of it based on like whatever my recommender system or model gave me right now each of these items like whether it's a movie or it's an uh, it's a uh, like an item to be bought on amazon each each has a utility attached to it so it's a it's an uh, like a way of representing how useful this item is for the user and this this uh, utility has two parts right so the one is observed utility the second one is random component obviously we cannot do anything about the random component but observed utility can be estimated with item and customer attributes that i talked about earlier more importantly we have this like an existing multinomial logic model which is the mnl uh, we can predict the the uh, probability of somebody selecting something so this p of i is like probability of item i being selected and it is a function of uh, like observed utility which is v of i Okay, all of that is good. Obviously, I'm interested in the probability of somebody not selecting anything because that's what I, I kind of found, right? So I'm trying to, to uh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I've never used Zoom before. I'm used to WebEx, so this is, yeah. Anyways, so this no choice probability I found is also a function of, of utilities here. And here, if I, like as, as long as I'm like, I adding items to this like assortment, this is going down, right? So according to these existing models, what's happening is the no choice probability keeps going down as I add more items. So essentially there is more incentives giving more and more to, to the customer, which is not really true in practice, right? So we found that there were gaps in the existing models and we developed like these new models that are known as the multinomial logic cardinality effects model or the CE models. They take care of this cardinality element. And these are used as inputs to assortment optimization problem in order to give us an optimal assortment that we can offer to a customer. Okay, so how do these models work? A very small kind of element was added to the existing V of I. So if you remember, V of I was nothing but the, the representative utility. So this was a function of item attributes and customer attributes. But because we have this empirical evidence, we said that this is also a function of assortment attributes. And in specific, the size of my assortment. This utility is impacting, the, the size of the assortment is impacting the utility of the item. And so I have to take that into account. And so this V of I became a function of V of I of S and a cardinality element P of S got added. So as you can see here, Z plays a role. So remember the inverted U-shaped curve? We said that this, this becomes overwhelming beyond that Z, right? So that's what we are capturing here. The Z is an input parameter. Alpha is also a tuning parameter. It tells us how much high this information overload effect is. So having said that, we devise these new models, and, and actually I have like four or five models, but I'm presenting only two of them here. Um, yeah, so just two of them. One is for uh, like mobile phones, where you have a scrolling model, which means this alpha, which impacts the information overload, like stays the same. The second one is the discrete view model, which has alpha for every different page. So, so like imagine you're like uh, trying to do shopping, uh, on a computer and you have like different pages. So every page will have a different alpha. So that's that's what's going on here. Um, okay, so based on these two models, we try to predict the probability of like somebody not selecting anything, right? So remember in the existing model, we did not have anything like, like as the, the no choice, like as we added more items, no choice declined, but that's not the case here. And the most important outcome of our model is that there is a utility value that get, gets attached to the no choice option which actually tells us that there is some value for not selecting anything. And that's the reason why people were not um, like selecting anything, right? And so, so this model actually gives us the, the idea that yeah, like the like utility of not selecting something has a finite value. And that's why the no choice probability gets somewhat a different uh, form in these models. Okay, so again, we did some probability, like we did some analysis with simulated data and we found out that there is this minimum point that exists like as we keep adding items, right? The no choice probability goes down and then it begins to increase. 
that gives us an idea of like, okay, maybe somewhere here that assortment can lie, which is optimal and that will make people select things, right? Okay, I'm not going into the details or the math details because like we have a lot of uh, uh, small analytical results, but this is the, the gist of this entire theorem. And then the usage of these models. Obviously we can use them as inputs to assortment optimization problem uh, because like assortment optimization is important, right? For demand planning, for like giving out that assortment to a customer. So we use them as inputs to assortment optimization problem and found different things. But one thing that I wanted to point out here is that this is what the, the normal form, if you go and look any research paper, this is the normal form of uh, an assortment optimization problem. We are trying to maximize the expected profit, right? So here you see that there is a revenue attached to every item and then there is a cost attached to every item multiplied by its probability minus like this overall operating cost. But if you think about a platform like Netflix, right? Um, we can say that this, this difference is constant and this does not exist. This is a zero because it's, it has no dependence on the, the operating costs. So eventually we found out that even in, a, in an assortment optimization setting, what we really want to do for a platform like Netflix is that we want to minimize the no choice probability. Okay, so that was again a, a result that was in line with what our findings were earlier, right? So then we use that and solve a few assortment optimization problems. And these are the results that we got. A deeper or a bigger assortment is was always more profitable under MNL, but that's not the case in the models that we developed, specifically MNLCE models. And most importantly, MNLC models provide a stopping criteria. So they tell us, okay, stop here, don't add more items. Otherwise the no choice probability is going to go up and people are not going to select anything, right? So this is what this depicts. Um, I'm, I'm not going into a lot of detail. Basically we developed an algorithm that can find this minimum point for us. And yeah, so that's there in my paper, that's a published work. So if you're interested, just go ahead and, and please read it. Uh, the other important aspect, of, I've been asked a lot of questions about it, is estimating model parameters. Of course, that's a challenge. If you remember the alpha and the Z that I talked about, and we considered them as like um, input parameters, right? Uh, but obviously in a real world scenario, you need to take the data and, and estimate them, right? So essentially it's a classification problem where I'm trying to classify an incoming customer but as, as, a, as a select or a no select category. Whether this person selects something, yes, or whether this person did not select anything, no. Right? So I'm trying to categorize customers in, in, in this. And essentially our model is a linear model. So we did an, a logistic regression setup and I used two different algorithms, gradient descent and neutral raffson also, although this is like pretty basic, just to get an idea of like what alpha and Z could be, right? The biggest hurdle that we have right now with this research is that we have lack of data. We don't have data that the way we require it. Uh, none of the online retailers are capturing the fact that this customer comes in and what happens if I offer him or her 10 items versus 20 items versus 30 items. So all the capture is transaction. And so we were, we didn't have data, but however, I have like this, there is an empirical study and they had aggregate data. So we used that and we did some estimation with alpha and Z. Obviously the results weren't as, as good as we had expected. And, and obviously uh, the error is, is, is pretty high and that would be attributed not to the technique itself, right? But, but to the, um, deficiency in data because we don't have the data that we require in order to estimate the parameters of these models. Uh, however, we do have a paper that talks about how to use simulated data and, and estimate these parameters. And that, that that's the one that I uh, talked about earlier in one of the earlier slides. Okay, so uh, in summary, we developed random utility models or uh, like a new class of random utility models because the existing RUMs and recommender system models do not take cardinality context effect into account. Um, these generic models incorporate the effect of information overload as a result of assortment size or assortment cardinality into the existing random utility models. I have two other models that take into account novelty and diversity. So this is again, a, a, like a very pressing issue for uh, platforms like Amazon and Netflix. Like if I like, uh, for example, an action movie, you, you just keep recommending action movies only to me, right? Then you're not exposing me to other stuff. So then the, this, this is my, uh, another paper that's coming up uh, it's submitted under review. And there's another published work which is talking about what happens about those properties of assortments when there is similarity versus cardinality. So how the interaction takes place, so I have that, and use these as inputs to assortment optimization problem. So a complete implementation is presented in the paper. Obviously, ran out of time, I'm really sorry. Implications are that we can use them for personalized recommendations, le leading to lower choice deferrals, like making customers uh, select more, right? So that's it. This is my work in progress. 
Um, that's it from my end. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. If there are any questions, I'm here. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Yuzma, for that interesting talk. And yeah. we have we have some questions from the audience. Uh, sure. Okay. The first one is, how do you establish that model? Can you explain something about it? Oh, yeah, sure. So if you think like, so as I said, the model is based on like redefining the utility of an item, right? So there is some utility, some value that attached to a given item, right? So in, in, in like existing models, the way that's established is by using item and customer attributes, right? And they don't take assortment properties into account. And obviously there are lots of assortment properties. So what, what we were focusing on is the assortment size. So how about redefining the utility and then calculating the choice probabilities using those utilities, right? So that's, that's how we established the model. And yes, it, it kind of resonates with a lot of like existing empirical research, right? And um, that, that kind of uh, validates it. But yeah, as I said, the, the only downside here is that I'm still looking for real world data so that we can estimate the alpha and the Z and then and then uh, maybe like implement it in a real world scenario. But that's how we establish the model. Okay, uh, we have another question here. Which assumptions are set or used for the users in the proposed models? The users okay. or viewers have complete information? Yeah, so that's an excellent question, actually. Yeah, so again, if we go back and look at the basic multinomial logic model, because this model is built on that, right? So they have this restriction that there are certain customer, like there are certain attributes of the item that are known to them. And, 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 and that's how we derive utility. So that is a big assumption, right? They don't know everything, but yeah, these, these are the different attributes that are known to, known to them. So that's an existing like assumption for the multinomial logic model. That's the existing model, and we build on that. Yeah. Okay. So we have another one. I have feel this was frustration with the recommender system in Netflix. However, I think the Amazon recommender system is quite nice, at least for me. Does this probability of not selecting anything could also depend on the quality of the recommendations? Absolutely, right? And not just the quality. It depends on the customer, right? So that's why I'm going and predicting things. Like maybe the no choice for you uh, could be really, and that's why I said like go and check my paper in which I have like the entire implementation. So it's not for every customer, but every person is different. So maybe for you, the no choice probability was like extremely low. Maybe the multinomial logic model was doing what, what it's supposed to do, but for me, it's not doing that, right? So it, it, it like depends on your uh, way of thinking about it. And that's why we said context effect, right? So the context of choice matters here. Which is which is why obviously like no model applies to everybody, right? So that's why we are categorizing people into uh, like somebody who selected versus somebody who did not select, and the alpha and the z that I'm going to predict are going to be different for both types of customers, even given the same assortment. Yeah. Okay, you thank you again. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm like this is I'm, I'm truly honored. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Bye.